Hello everyone, welcome to today's Novage webinar, V-Ray Studio Tips with Rhino and Dave. Dave Schultz is a product designer, architect, and educator. Known as a notorious 3D geek, Dave is most recently an entrepreneur with a game company startup called Gridopolis Games. Winner of six design awards and a successful Kickstarter, Gridopolis will be launching in early 2020. Keep a lookout for it. And Dave Scholz, most importantly, has been using uh, V-Ray professionally as well as teaching at university and LinkedIn learning for over 10 years. Dave has the rare gift of making technical stuff stuff easy and fun, and you will see what I mean. And um, so today, as you know, uh, Dave is a LinkedIn learning instructor of 50 and plus courses on Ryan and V-Ray. And uh, in fact, his Rhino 5 course passed 1 million views. For uh, people that are watching today, uh, we have a treat. And you can use the, this code on the right to get 30 days of LinkedIn learning free. And also, I urge you to check out um, professor3d.com for free videos and information on how to hire Dave. I don't see the link page. Um, OK, I will. I will uh, add it to the chat so everybody will can take it away from there. So I'll share with everybody. Sorry about that. And uh, now let me tell you just quickly a little bit about Novage. This is a proud page where we sell V-Ray. And Novage is changing the way designers purchase theory software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice, faster service, and most importantly, no headaches. So check us out at Novage.com. And now, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass uh, the, screen, the screen to Dave. And uh, so he can get center stage here. Take it away, Dave. Hello, everybody. I'm going to turn my camera on briefly. I may have to hide this later because it's been covering up stuff way too much. So I'll shrink it down. Oh, it went full screen. Sorry, I'll just turn it back off. Okay, so uh, I want to say thanks to Barbara and Noveg. Also, um, not here is Chaos Group. These are the guys who make V-Ray and have been doing that for a long time, and also they're sponsoring this webinar. So today I'm going to go over some of my favorite tips. Uh, rendering uh, with any software can be very scary. I try to make it easy and fun. And just to prove I'm a 3D nerd, I have a polygon portrait right there. So I don't know anyone else who's got that. So hopefully that counts. I'm gonna close this up. Okay. So um, so one, you can get in touch with me several ways if you're curious for any follow-ups. So as Barbara mentioned, I am on LinkedIn. You can just find me under my name, David Schultz. Don't forget, there's lots of letters in there. Um, I've done a lot of uh, courses on LinkedIn. I think that's 16 at last count. So here's the code Barbara was mentioning. So if you want to use Dave 30 day, you're going to get 30 days of LinkedIn learning for free. I think normally it's like 25 or $30 and up. And if you just want to find the courses I have done, there's the second link, Dave courses. So I'll just save you a little bit of searching time. And finally, um, one of my favorite things besides design is teaching. I teach at a local university for almost 20 years and on LinkedIn learning, but I also do individual training slash tutoring and with groups. So you can get a hold of me through my website where I do training at professor3d.com. This is a cool place to go because a lot of times the LinkedIn courses are very large and formal. And if I just have a, a real short video idea for my class, then uh, that's where you'll find it. Okay. Uh, today we're going to be using uh, Rhino 6. It's important to notice uh, to note that uh, there's been 20 service releases. I think only the last three are working with V-Ray Next. So they changed the name. It used to be uh, version 3.5, then 6. Now it's Next, which is actually 4.1. So there's a very new version came out a week or two ago. Also, I am using the Space Mouse. You'll see this in just a minute. This is a 3D navigator. Uh, here's what they look like. Um, I've got this large one on the top left, but you can also buy um, the small, more portable one. And all the stuff I just mentioned from the software to the hardware is available at your friendly NoVeg retailer. Okay, so why do you use V-Ray? Well, obviously you guys are here because you're interested, 
but I'm going to give you a little background why I made the decision to jump. First of all, it's the best rendering engine out there. Um, and you just need to go to the, the forum and you will be convinced. So they've got um, amazing stuff, a lot of well-known movies, uh, architects use it, and it's just stunning. I've had, I've had minor arguments with people who said something else is better. They go to this page and they pretty much give up, change their mind. Uh, the other thing this a lot of people don't consider, V-Ray runs as a plugin inside of Rhino. So why that matters is it will greatly speed up your workflow. I've been twice as fast from in the past when I used to go outside of Rhino, I do a rendering, but then if the design changed, the materials changed back and forth, back and forth, it was really slow. So they say, you know, time is money. I think, I think it's more importantly, higher quality if you're, if you're able to produce quicker. Okay, so um, getting into the 3D stuff, we're gonna cover two studio types. Um, these are really simple based on real world equivalents. The first one is what I call the glow wall. This is just my name for it. And this is gonna give us a really sweet, clean environment. So we'll see no background at all, no horizon, and the focus will be just on the work. You're gonna see that in just a second. And I use this for about 90% 90, 90 of my projects. When I can't use that, because maybe it's a little bit uh, too transparent or it's too shiny, it disappears. We use just a simple bowl studio. So this is nothing more than like a seamless, like the uh, paper you would see in a photographer's studio, the paper that goes across the table and maybe up the wall. So that's the same idea. I just kind of rotate it around. So again, like I said, this, this helps to have a darker environment when your materials, your design is very bright or transparent. Okay, some examples. Finally, this is the Glow Wall Studio. And you'll notice that it, there's an environment here, but it's taking a, a second seat to the design. So notice that we see that there's a floor because we have a reflection, but I keep it soft and blurry and it fades away pretty quick. We don't see the edge of whatever table is there and we don't see the background. That makes for much better presentations. Like this, you can just put text right on top. So that's really important when you're trying to get others to buy in, when you're pitching your ideas to your boss or, or for a job or to clients. Um, this is a variation on that. Um, I'm just saving that last rendering with no uh, background and then just in Photoshop do a nice subtle gradient. And I did that because I wanted to have the top edge pop. Remember, if you have a white background and a white highlight, it's gonna tend to disappear. So taking that to the uh, extreme is if you have stuff that's very shiny like this metallic reflections there's white on the top edge it's white up there and it's transparent so then we just use the paper-based seamless or bowl studio so those are the two basic um, studio setups we'll be covering today it's important to know before you just start rendering is there's components to these things obviously the design is critical um, you want to have some variety it doesn't it, even if it's minimalist you wanna have some features or details. So I, if I had one takeaway is make sure you get the fillets right. A lot of beginners have razor sharp edges that not only looks fake, you can't manufacture it and you have nothing to catch the highlights. So we're talking a lot about highlights, making things look sexy and to pop out. Materials, so again, if you're doing minimalist, you need to have some sort of accent somewhere. So maybe one part is glossy, another part is matte if it's the same color. Um, one takeaway from this is avoid the super shiny things. A lot of beginners love the super cheesy Vegas shiny stuff. So I'm gonna dial it down whenever possible and it looks way more real. And finally, lighting. This can be the trickiest part to get right. So these are all three about equally important. So it's not just enough to have a cool design. You gotta get the materials and lighting right. We're gonna use some large rectangular lights that uh, is all I need. There's probably five, six different lights inside of V-Ray. We just need one kind and we can probably get away with one or two and that's it. This is what I was talking about, making things simple. So the large size gives us not only soft shadows, uh, but also large highlights that flow around the surface and really make it pop and define the form. Okay, enough lists, sorry about that. I think it's important to understand the strategy. So I like to give people some of the background. So here is Toasterbot, you might've seen this guy on the promo, um, he is a state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, internet-connected 
toasting device. Unfortunately, there's one minor bug. He's got a severe bread phobia. So as a result, you, you can see what's going on here. I'm gonna turn off one of them and just start with um, this single guy. I wanna talk about um, the entire scene. So we have the character or your product design. And this is the glow wall studio. That's all there really is. And the reason I broke it into two parts, we've got the backdrop and we've got the floor, is so I can assign different materials onto them. Uh, I think I showed you the blurry reflections. Uh, so that means we keep them on the floor and the floor is uh, kind of a light color and it pretty much disappears. And then the background is a, a simple uh, vertical wall. And I've made it about 180 degrees there for a, a pretty helpful reason. When you get in, a lot of times you're gonna be moving around. And so your, your wall stays in the frame. If you just had a flat backdrop, you would see the edge pretty quickly. So this takes care of that problem. Okay, so that's the basic thing. We've got uh, our model, uh, we've got our environment. Let's talk about some of the lights. So you'll notice a lot of people do really small lights. Um, I make mine very generous. So let's just notice here that this thing really covers a lot of space. It's almost covering the whole floor. So as a general rule of thumb, I would say, <clears throat> have it um, be much bigger than the product below it, uh, three, four, five times wider. And so if you can imagine, we're gonna do a rendering here in a second, it's gonna, the highlight is gonna wrap around the top of this character or product. And remember I said small like spotlights or point lights, the reflections are just dots. So it's not dramatic. We gotta go with the larger rectangular lights. Okay, so um, another thing to remember about lighting is, we'll get into more detail here. I'm gonna make this uh, much stronger at the top and a weaker light on the side. So if you're a photographer, you would call this the key light and this would be your fill light. So if that's a 10 power, I make this one typically about half. Now those are just uh, starting points. Uh, it all depends on your design and the reflectivity of the material and a lot of other stuff. But those are the basics. Um, we want to do a quick rendering here. I think that's always a good idea. So I've got my V-Ray uh, toolbar dock right there. Here we can show the asset editor. So I'm going to get into some of these settings here in a minute. Let's just do a quick render and see how everything looks together. So now we see the background completely disappearing. The floor only shows up kind of where we need it, which is just for some shadows and reflections. So otherwise, uh, if that if you don't have that effect of the floor being present, it tends to look like uh, it's floating in space. So you do need something to ground a, a real world object. So that rendering is <clears throat> just about done. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanna talk about the camera next. That's a really a component that a lot of people forget. So you'll notice here, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it. It's, it's almost done, but I wanna talk about the camera and its position. I see a lot of people and students, especially just because it's beginning to learn. <clears throat> I'm gonna lock that so I don't keep moving it. Just kind of randomly place the camera and they tend to be a little bit on the high side. So why that's a problem, I, I think that's not as dramatic. Um, this product or character can look a little bit lonely like this guy here. Um, I think if you come down to their level, things are automatically more dramatic. And if you look a lot of advertising for products, you'll notice the exact same thing. Another thing you might have noticed is uh, this guy looks like he's alone. And I've always found it challenging to make interesting, compelling renderings with just one single product. And a lot of times when students and professionals do presentations, they'll do the front three quarter or left three quarter and then they'll do the other side right so you have two different renderings and then you put them together on the same presentation board or pdf the problem is then they kind of fight with each other it looks like you're almost cross-eyed the two views look like they're seen from one camera even though there's separate renderings and that can happen when you don't see the edges or background so this seems like a really cool trick i've used so far uh it, it's very powerful that is the extra prop, the characters. So I always keep my work right there on the origin in case I'm gonna make changes. But 
if I'm getting close to a final rendering, I will make a copy and then rotate it. So now we're seeing, I should move this out of the way. We're seeing one character, maybe a little bit closer, more detail from one side. And we're seeing the other side of the, the, of the same character, but a copy. And of course, if your design changes, you just take this guy here and throw him away. All you're doing is making a copy, you're pasting, moving, rotating, and then you have a much more dramatic composition. This makes a huge deal. I, I struggled with this for a long time, how to make one object interesting and compelling. And it, I just kept failing over and over. I kept going with crazy camera angles, tipping the camera, you know, trying to emulate comic books. Uh, and it never worked. And finally, I was just, it dawned on me, if you, if you think of like a painting, have you ever seen a still life with like a bowl and one fruit? No, there's multiple fruits. So that's why I said, I got to try this. And all of a sudden, boom, it was like, uh, I've, I've discovered <laughs> some secret. Now, uh, the camera placement can be challenging for some people, especially uh, if you're just using the keyboard. I've got that Space Pilot Navigator, and it's really easy to do the pan, zooms, and rotate all together. But if you don't have that, no big deal. I'm going to show you a cool little trick. The camera actually is invisible, but you can make it visible, and it's easier to maneuver. So just make sure you click on the perspective viewport here, hit F6. Notice in the other viewports, we get a camera that pops in there. That guy is movable. So I've got my gumball on, and notice when I move the camera up and down in the right viewport, I can really get a lot more control on the height. So the key with this Glow Wall Studio is we've got to be pretty low and looking level. And that's just a function of the back wall. We're going to talk about the materials in a minute. The back wall is emitting a little bit of light and it's reflecting on the floor and that's erasing the horizon line. But this does not work if you're looking straight down. So you've got to be kind of level. And if you have trouble moving, just use F6 to turn on the camera, get it down low. I recommend about halfway up any model or character. And then looking level, there's level or a little bit up. And so that's just an idea I've noticed from uh, one of the great examples is Apple ads. You see, a, you see a, a tablet or their iPhone, it looks like a building because they get a super low angle, really cool. Okay, so that's it with the studio and the camera. Um, let's try another rendering here just to see how this looks. So I try to navigate around. I'm gonna hit F6 to turn off the camera again. And let's just do another quick rendering. Um, we'll get into this asset editor, editor in just a minute. Uh, and we'll give you guys a tour of that. So here is the frame buffer. This is where all the rendering happens. And now you can see it's a much more engaging composition. This is uh, multiple components or characters or products starting to have what I think is an interesting dialogue. So if you can uh, create a little bit of dynamic motion or draw the eye in uh, or bring people into the scene, that's really going to help. Another thing I see with beginners is they sometimes um, zoom so far back that they, uh, they think you need to see the whole object every time. So notice here that the reflection just goes off the frame. The cord goes off the frame. The toast is getting cropped at the top. That's not an issue. We, we, we don't forget what's happening just because it got cropped, but we pull in to the design we spent all that time on. Okay, so that thing is finished. So hopefully you're getting the idea here with this studio. Let's talk about this um, asset editor. So I'm gonna close this guy here. Now, you might not have noticed, uh, we've got a couple of lights here, but I turned them off. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is broken down into some basic categories. So we've got all the materials I've used in the scene. Then we've got the lighting. Um, this is not used very often and we've got some special effects. I skipped that too. And we've got some environmental textures. We'll talk about that in a bit. Really the first two tabs. Now here's the tricky part. Uh, we've got other areas we can access. What I mean by that is we're in the center panel of a large dialog. So since we're in the materials, if we click on this little tiny arrow, it's not the best I think for UI, but there's a whole library of materials. And so I rarely have to design a material from scratch. I'll just grab something close. I, I love the plastics. Um, and then I drag it into this area here that we can then continue to modify and edit them. 
So once something is selected, you can then modify over on the right side. So this thing really collapses down uh, pretty small if you're not using either the right or left panel. Uh, let's talk about materials now since we're here. This plastic gray, there's a lot of attributes to materials, but I always try to keep things as simple as possible for myself for when I teach. So I would say two basic things we could probably focus on is just a diffuse color that is uh, a color we assign to it. And that is the diffuse color or channel. Some people refer to it. So that's it for the basic overall color. And then reflectivity is pretty important. Um, by default, a lot of things will come in really shiny, especially when you grab this one. Uh, and that it will be right around 98% glossy. Let's take a look at the floor, because I mentioned the blurry reflections. So I've already got the studio floor assigned, and you'll notice that the glossiness is 90%. So we're pulling back away from super sharp, shiny mirrors that can look a little bit cheesy. So we're just gonna have a little bit of a blur in it. Um, and the next thing is the diffuse color. Notice here, this looks white. It's actually not. Let's just click on the swatch and you'll see. I'm about 15% away from pure white. And this is really important. I see a lot of beginners cranking all the whites to the max. That's not gonna work well. The reason is, is we have lights in this scene. And as soon as a light hits something, it's gonna brighten it up. And if it's already 100% white, it's just gonna disappear. So this is true about both extremes. I never have anything perfectly black or perfectly white. I'm about 10 or 15% away so that you can get a little more real world realism. Okay, so that's a little bit about materials. Um, I'm gonna make some more here in a bit. Um, and that's, uh, I think, pretty much the, the basic uh, of panels here, but probably the most important one besides um, the materials and the lighting is the settings. So we can close this down here. Yeah, we can close that down there and just focus on this. A lot of stuff in here. Um, probably the most important development in the last couple versions is this quality slider. Oh my God, I can't tell you the pain I went through memorizing all of these settings in here. We've got a lot of sliders and numbers that are just confusing. So forget they exist over there. Just know that these sliders crank stuff up or down and you can just focus right here. You don't have to have like a, a spreadsheet to figure out what goes in there. And I did a couple versions ago. That's exactly how I did it. Uh, it wasn't fun. It was worth it as I got better and started memorizing some things. But this I think is a, a brilliant overhaul, the last version or two, so much simpler for beginners. So focus on quality. I've seen some students cranking this up early on, unnecessary. You don't need to do a 10 minute render to decide, oh, the light is horrible and the material doesn't look good. You can crank it down to like draft or low and in 10 seconds or 20 seconds, you can find out the same information. So use that quality, keep it low at the beginning, pretty important. Uh, the next uh, important area is the render output. The default is a 16 by nine widescreen. Well, you might not be widescreen mode if, you, if you're dragging the viewport over like I just did. You might wanna get whatever that aspect ratio is. Is it 16 by nine? I have no idea, I don't think so. So come over here and just match the viewport. So that way we don't get a surprise cropping. I've seen a lot of students make that mistake. So you go in here, match the viewport. This is the refresh button if needed. So let's do a quick test render of that. And it's gonna be a little more dramatic. We get a wide screen and uh, it's exactly the ratio that you tell it to be. So there you go. And a lot of times I will render way bigger than I need, especially if I uh, wanna have space for, for text as we talked about, and you can always crop it back. But now we don't have the uh, surprise cropping. That's exactly the same ratio of the viewport. So that's pretty important there. Let's close that guy down. And this is still rendering. You'll notice right here, it's continuing to render even though that uh, render window that I clicked on there was still going. Okay, a couple other areas is we have environment. So we've talked about the lights. The environment lighting is actually a big part of that too. So I don't know if you guys noticed, these two lights are off. 
I've here's the icon to turn them back on. So why did I do that? Well, I wanted to show you that uh, to prevent people from having you know pitch black renders, there is an environmental uh, graphic basically mapped onto a dome. So there is an environment that you can see in reflections and that it also casts light. Let's take a quick look at this guy. This is the texture swatch. And this graphic is actually wrapped around a dome. And so with no lights in the scene, we got a really good rendering. So what this is intended to simulate is an area of bright and dark, almost like a studio where you have a couple spotlights and then you have a dark room behind you. So imagine this square graphic, it's a little bit tricky. It is wrapped around to a sphere. It's always there, so it's really cool. And uh, just be aware that that's why you're getting good renders right out of the gate. That's a nice improvement they did. So if we go back to the lights, remember this is always on. We can now turn on the other two lights and we can get more of the highlights. So I want to point your attention to, we can get just general illumination with the environmental light. Um, which is the graphic, sorry, it's, it's, it's a light source, but it's, it's a graphic casting light from the bright spots, less lights coming from the dark spots. So it's a little confusing sometimes. But the two rectangles are the ones that are casting direct light. So that's it for lighting, really, is you've got ambient or environmental light, and that is uh, that graphic we're looking at right here. And then we've got the two rectangular lights. I've got one on the top, at a 10 power. We're gonna, we're gonna actually recreate these lights and go over some of the settings here in a minute. But let's just uh, re-render this. And I'll open up my frame buffer. And now we're gonna see a, it's really starting to pop. In fact, it may be overlit a bit. So it's another thing to be aware of. Let's let it finish rendering. So you're gonna start to see a way better definition, highlights. We get highlights on the top of the knob. We get highlights along the cord. Just really strong highlights up there, highlights on top of the handle. And that was um, what I talked about earlier, the importance of making fillets so that these highlights have somewhere to reflect in. So I try to avoid at all costs sharp edges. So you're saying, well, it looks a little too bright, Dave. Well, you're right, we're adding lights and we haven't uh, adjusted. So one quick thing you're gonna do as you add lights, you can't have uh, the lights, uh, they start to add up. So let's go over to the, the studio here. I'm going to have the in background environment light. That's the graphic that's wrapped under the sphere. It's 100% power. I'm going to knock it down to 50%. We don't need it as much now. We've got our own lights we just installed. Uh, I never go down to zero, maybe um, from one quarter to a half. So let's just re render. And I think this will kind of hit a happy medium. Um, with the viewport selected here, perspective is selected. You can just hit the shortcut, which is the render last scene. And now I think it's really coming into uh, some a sweet spot. So we're having highlights and you can see the contribution of the background of that environment. It really makes a big difference. If we didn't have that graphic wrapping and changing shade, bright to dark, bright to dark as it wrapped around, this might be looking into the void of black space. So reflective materials are only as interesting as their environment. So that's why you have to go to a little extra effort when things are reflective. So I think that's a way better so far right there. Um, you're probably noticing that we're spending a bit of time waiting for renderings to, to complete. So I'm gonna show you a really cool shortcut. Uh, and I actually use this shortcut through the majority of, of my project as things evolve. I'll do renderings you know, pretty fairly regularly, fairly often, uh, not constantly, but every time I make a major design change, I'll render it to see how it looks. Um, and I wanna see something fast. So this is really great new feature. It's an override to all the materials. Now remember, all this reflectivity, all these texture maps on the toast, takes time to calculate. Uh, reflections of reflections takes more time. So if you just want to get a basic feel for the form, this is the way to go. Uh, this is in our settings. It's material override. And we're just going to say, listen, okay, ignore every material, just use this shade of gray. So no reflections, no texture maps, no nothing. I kind of go towards the middle. 
So we can leave it at that. Let's re-render, this is one switch. This saves you from having to uh, you know, change all the materials. We can turn off and back on and then it works great. So let's just do a quick re-render of this guy. So you'll notice that the character looks really cool. He's well-defined and this is super fast. This is almost done here in a fraction of the time. The only thing I wish it would do a little bit better is the floor and wall. So hang on, we can tell the override to not override. So I'll show you where that is. We're gonna go to the materials and I've got my studio glowing emissive wall. And we'll just say, listen, you cannot override me. So that's the back wall. Here's the floor. And again, over here in the settings, same thing. So you may wanna say you're overriding the override. That's fun to say. Okay, let's re-render this. And I, um, but before we do, just let's stop for a moment to check out the lighting. And you'll see that the light, which is right above, is doing a fantastic job. Highlights wrapping around, capturing on edges, that flat face or this uh, edge of the bread. Also, you'll notice that the light is, is definitely, uh, it's communicating its presence by the fact that it's brighter on this part and less bright on here and it kind of washes down. So when we build our light here in just a second, uh, I'm gonna talk about the location of lighting as being really critical. You wanna have a noticeable gradation, makes the scene look way more 3D. Okay, so we just made two changes to the back wall and the floor. Let's re-render. So these are just fantastic. They're just as quick, but now I have a really clean study rendering. So I can share this with other people. And I found that a lot of times in the middle of the design process, materials can be very distracting. In fact, a lot of times I'll leave them towards the end. This is really powerful uh, technique. So uh, avoid putting materials until you get the design looking awesome in one color. Then materials are just kind of icing on the cake. And here we're able to focus uh, entirely on the, uh, on the design because we, um, made the floor and wall kind of disappear, uh, not be affected by the override. So if I were to stop this, it's so easy here with the settings, override everything back off, and I'll start that rendering up one more time. Okay, there's all our materials, they're back. I didn't have to make a copy of the whole file and apply a bunch of materials and reapply them somewhere else. Everything's back, that's a really cool feature. I use that primarily in the beginning, and a lot of designers and renderers will use this um, neutral gray, kind of a, sometimes called a clay render, to get their lighting just right. So it can be powerful for that too, not just for progress reports before you pick materials, but also just to dial in the lighting. Okay, let's go look at the lights now. We can stop this guy. And I'm gonna just throw this light away as well, uh, we'll leave, um, then, then side light too. So uh, we, we create a new light. I'm gonna make sure I'm on the lighting layer. By the way, you might notice I'm pretty organized with the layers here, uh, I just like to be able to move fast. And if I don't touch a file for a week or a month, I don't wanna be uh, confused or angry. And this is also really important in offices if you're sharing your file, just keep those layers organized with names that make sense. So I'm gonna make sure I put the light on the light layer. Uh, right here is my uh, V-Ray toolbar that, that gets turned on automatically. So I wanna make a rectangular light. So I'm just gonna pick a couple of points, start on one side, click, and there's a big rectangular light. Now, a lot of times, depending on which direction you go, your light is upside down. So let's get it up in space first. And we're gonna talk about the three properties of lights. Um, first of all, we have its position. So just like a real world light, higher up is not gonna be as bright. Too close, and you're just gonna be blasting away. So I tend to start off at like three or four times higher. That's just close enough that I can see that wash of light. I, if you were way up in the sky, um, let's say you're 10 times higher, way up here, uh, the light would be pretty much the same everywhere, but here, there's a noticeable difference. Now the next thing is uh, kind of even more important besides the size and the distance is the intensity. 
the default lights are a hundred. That is way too high for these interior scenes. These are very small little studio setups. That's the purpose of the webinar. So I'm gonna knock this down to 10. That's a really uh, useful number that seems to work in most projects. So that's what the other one was. Uh, you're probably saying, hey, it's pointing up. Yes, I noticed. So you can rotate that guy around. There's a really cool uh, keyboard shortcut. Uh, just type in the word F-L-I-P. I'm up there on the command line. And that changes the direction of both surfaces and lights. So that's kind of handy. So you can move this guy around. Now it's got the value of 10. And let's check it out. Let's check the rendering. So we'll go to the teapot here. That starts our rendering. And our frame buffer is down below. It's also useful to see that each light will con contribute just some uh, a different amount of light or reflections to the scene. So now we don't have the side light. It's not quite as bright over here. So a lot of times I will just use one big light. That's it. This studio with the background, that's casting a little bit of light. Um, we're going to talk about that material here in a minute. Uh, and the environment sometimes is enough. So depending on how many lights and their power and the environment's value, you'll have to go back and forth a little bit, but you usually will dial it in pretty quick. This looks almost perfect. I think it's got uh, just enough contrast. Um, we've got separation. We're not having anything blow out against the background. Okay, so that's, uh, I think I'm, I need to jump over to the bowl now just to make sure I don't run out of time. So we covered the camera and where it's located. We've covered um, the backdrop. I do want to cover the materials uh, briefly. Uh, so uh, I think I'll save that for when we hit the bowl here in a second. All right, so I'm going to switch layers. I'm going to turn off that studio with the glow wall. And let's just say that this was so shiny, it was disappearing in the background. That's easy to do on reflective materials. So I'm going to go with the bowl. Here's how it looks. Let's zoom out a bit. So as you might have guessed, it's got a gentle, gentle curve. Um, I just drew a straight, uh, sorry, a control point curve uh, along that edge. If we hide this, you can see exactly what I did. So there's the curve. Turn on the control points. Yeah, I'm not gonna go ahead and draw this because I wanna make sure we get plenty of time for questions. So that's it, it's a control point curve. I made sure I had a bunch of uh, control points flat on the ground. Um, notice, as you get up in the air, it starts to pull it up. So I wanted a flat surface underneath my characters. Okay, so let's bring that back. There we go. So I just did a 180 revolve, pretty straightforward. All right, we can zoom in here. Let's get the camera in a good spot. By the way, right now, we may be able to see the light on our previous studio setup. Um, the light was white and the background was white, probably didn't notice. But if it shows up now, that's an important light setting. Let's just go ahead and uh, render this. Make sure I get the low angle. And let's see how that looks. I'm gonna keep the light in the scene. There's a setting we can turn lights to make them invisible. They still cast light and shadow and reflections, but they just don't appear to the camera. So let's just render this guy right here. And I'm gonna open up my frame buffer. So you're gonna notice a big difference. This is a studio that looks like it's, um, a part of the image. It's not disappearing like the last one. Um, but for a lot of products, that's what's needed. I tend to use the glow wall the majority of the time. There's our light. We're going to talk about how to fix that in a minute. Um, you'll also notice um, this, this material here. I've assigned kind of a light matte color. So we'll look at that material here in a second. Um, so let's cut, let's check those things so we can finish in the time I planned. Um, I'm gonna stop that rendering. So we talked about the light, if you can pick that light. Um, another way to access it, besides going over to the V-Ray Asset Editor, is uh, Rhino is pretty well connected. You can just say, open that up. Um, one thing to be aware of on the light is you get these nice previews. We already talked about the previews for the materials, but the lights have previews too. And there's our value of 10, which we can change, and the options to make it invisible. These are only a couple things I, I change on anything, whether it's the, the material or the light. Now, the other thing, uh, you can see the, it gives you a great little preview. 
Another thing to remember about these rectangular lights, uh, when I first started, I would change the angle up, down, left, right, and um, thinking this rendering doesn't look good. And I, but what I finally realized is the light comes pretty much out. We can turn it on there. It comes out almost 180 degrees. So the angle of that light up in the, up in the sky doesn't matter at all. And you can actually crank it up and down uh, on the directionality slider here, just to show you. So there's highly directional. It's almost like a spotlight, kind of weird. It's casting a, you know, like a beam. I just keep it wide open and I don't have to worry about how exactly close or far it is because it just shoots out literally 180 degrees. So that's a couple things about the light. You get to see nice little previews. Um, let's talk about some materials. I'm gonna make a material for this back wall. So let's go over. What I recommend you guys do is just grab something already made. It's got so many components to it. There is a create section here when you're uh, super advanced. You can make materials from their fundamental components. Forget that for now. I don't do it. So I just go look to find a plastic that's close. There's a lot of ones with textures. Let's skip those. I'm just going to go with a simple, simple plastic that is, and this is my favorite one, simple, shiny gray. All right, we're going to drop it in over here. And looking at the material, I'm going to just rename it. That's kind of important. So let's call it the uh, bow material, just so I don't get these mixed up. Um, and then we had a couple factors we talked about. The diffuse color, number one, it's kind of a, a medium gray. Let's lighten that up. Don't want to go perfectly white. Good. The next thing, and this is actually pretty critical, a lot of materials come in at uh, very high gloss. This is almost 100%, 98. Um, the important thing to remember about this studio is if it were 98% glossy, you would see reflections, not only in the ground, but curving up. That's a big problem. So we want to dial that down, make it more like paper, more of a matte material. So I just typically go to maybe 0.5 and look what happens. It's very soft. You're not actually seeing a reflection of light. You're just seeing it fade away, nice gradient. So we can apply that. Uh, and a lot of people forget this. They make uh, uh, some geometry, they make a material, they forget to assign it. So let's just right click on here and apply to the selected object in the scene. So a lot of times you'll just grab the nearest material or a material already in your scene and then just make a copy of it. So the way you would do that, if I want to do another floor, just right click and duplicate it. So if something's close, but the wrong color, just copy it. These are very complicated, highly layered technical materials. So try to stay away from some of those details. Just keep it, keep it really simple. All right. So don't forget, we've got that environment here. We've got the lights. We've got two lights in this scene. Let's see how this looks now and do another quick render. So the only thing I think might help with this is we could modify the color of the background or we can put more lighting in that environmental sphere section. So if this were a little too dark back there, it actually looks pretty good to me, but let's just say it was a little bit dark. Oh, it looks like that light is not invisible. I may have missed that. Let's stop for a second and make a quick fix. There's the light. Let's go to V-Ray. And here is the rectangle light. And it should be one of our options, invisible. I think I uh, unchecked it talking about it. And then we go to the settings to get into these basic areas here. Um, the background is, the background light is dialed down to half power. We said we want it brighter. Let's bring it up to like three quarters power. And this is uh, probably going to be perfect. I don't get into you know smaller gradations of of anything. Okay, so we got the light invisible. Remember, we got the rectangular lights that are direct, and then we got the environmental or ambient lighting. So the, those tweaks, this thing should look a bit different. So the background is going to lighten up. Didn't change the material color. Just threw more light at it. So you can see there's only a couple things I've been playing around with, and that's really the key of this entire process. Whether I use the Glow Wall Studio or this bowl, I don't want to have 50 lights and, and things, too many settings. I like being able to just uh, make a couple pieces of geometry, whether it's a floor and a wall or a bowl. I'm done with the studio. 
a couple of lights. I think we've used one here and then two in the other scene. Boom, we're done. We don't have to spend so much time moving and, and navigating around. So I think I have an extra minute if Barbara lets me. Um, I just want to show you a really cool new feature uh, that's actually been around for a while, but uh, many people never touch this. Um, and the reason is they go to Photoshop and they crank up the contrast. Perfectly normal thing to do. But we have a lot of controls inside V-Ray. Uh, it's very powerful. Uh, we're going to have to turn them on with this button here on the lower left. It's called Corrections Control. And if you know what curves are in Photoshop, it's the exact same thing. If you don't, you're going to learn right now. So I'm going to open up this curves here. Notice we have a flat line. So our range of colors from light to dark is unaffected. Now, um, I think it looks better if we turn on the curve and we make the brights a little brighter. So I'm just going to make this. And we're, what we're creating is a classic S curve. And the dark's a little darker. Whoa. This two tweaks has made my rendering pop. It's really coming alive. And I didn't have to change the lights, the background, the, the materials, um, and my exposure and all the other settings. I just applied this correction curve. Um, just to see how powerful this is, I'm going to hit the, the off button. Things look a little more flat. You thought it was great. Well, it can always get better. Boom! It just pops right now. So a lot of people know about this from either video editing or Photoshop work, um, the curve correction, but it's built in to V-Ray. Now, it's really important because in the past, I might have um, played around with a whole bunch of settings or done that in Photoshop. Um, but here it's inside and I can make quick changes to whether it's the materials on the characters or the backdrop or the lights or whatever. In fact, this is something you should start to look for. This will now look a little flat and even. That's what I want. It's capturing all the detail. That's important. Um, but there's some technical reasons I won't get into. There's a lot of dynamic range you can't see on a monitor. V-Ray's calculated them. So basically, I'm taking a high dynamic range using a curve to correct. And so the, in, the parts you can't see of the, high, the brights and the darks get squeezed. And now you can see them on the monitor. In other words, it's a fancy way to um, crank up the contrast. So I think that will be another uh, useful tip in the future. This is one of those things, like um, I mentioned earlier, having the V-Ray as a plugin made me go twice as fast. This curve may uh, get you save you from doing half the number of renderings, because you can just bump it up and be done. So I'm looking at the time. I'm ready for any questions we have. Yes, Dave, thank you. That You make it look so easy and fun. No kidding. OK, so we have the first question. Um, do you use Rhino lights? Um, they pretty much work the same. Uh, any rectangular light will be treated by V-Ray as a V-Ray light. So you can use either one. OK. And how does V-Ray work with Bongo? Do you have any? It works great. I've done a lot of animations. Um, and one thing to remember is if you're animating 10 seconds, that's 300 renderings because typically you're at 30 frames a second. It works fantastic. Um, you can go to my schultzworks.com industrial design website. I've got some videos there. Um, no, it's the, I love doing that. In fact, um, Bongo is, is really perfect It's because it's another plugin. It works great with Rhino because they're both from McNeil. V-Ray works great because it's a plugin. Um, all the time I'll do like little turntable renderings, maybe at eight seconds, which is 240 frames of just the uh, design spinning around 360 degrees in eight seconds or 10 seconds. Typically though, as you noticed, we had to wait a while. That's one of those things. If you're gonna do a 10 second animation, you're gonna let Bongo and V-Ray work all night and come back the next morning, but it works fantastic. Cool. And uh, is there a difference rendering models made with NURB surfaces uh, versus meshes and, you know, one to yeah, well, one versus another. Okay, so I would say it all depends. A NURB surface is super smooth. These are all NURB surfaces here. Um, and then that's pretty important as you're modeling in 
uh, in Rhino, that's what Rhino natively does. I'm gonna turn the ISO curves on. So I just um, cranked up, let me make sure my studio, there we go. So you can see all the, all the ISO curves on here. Um, that's telling me this is a NURB surface. I would say if you use a mesh and it's been smooth, it's gonna work just as well. It's all a factor of the materials, the lights and the scene. Um, but a jagged mesh, no, it's gonna look bad. Uh, in fact, there's, there is one setting I wanna talk about here. If we zoom in, this is a little more advanced. You'll notice that the edge of this NURBS has a straight line every so often. You guys, can you see yeah, that, Barbara? Yeah, yeah, I can totally see Okay, that. so kind of a weird thing happening here. Uh, a NURBS, as we know, is infinitely smooth. It's basically formula of the curvature. So it doesn't have straight lines. Well, your video card can't show you something infinitely smooth. So it always approximates and things get a little bit blocky or um, uh, pixelated. So we can, compensate for that by going into the mesh. Every object in this scene has what's called a viewport mesh, or it's kind of a proxy type thing. It's a little technical, but what we can do is we can, um, this one's cranked all the way up to the max, but if you go the other direction, things get very jaggedy. And look at that, you can see the difference, yeah. all the straight lines. So there is a mesh in this scene, even though it's a nerves, and uh, most people didn't know that. So I'm gonna to go to that object, cut custom mesh. I'm gonna crank it back up. Okay, so that smooths out the corners. So, so my answer to can meshes look as good? Yes, if they're very, very smooth. Cool. Not, not a problem at all. Cool. And uh, somebody's commenting uh, that, you know, this uh, V-Ray, uh, it looks a little different than the older V-Ray. How, how, how easy totally... was it to get used to it? Well, I would say it took me a while because I was so used to the old uh, interface that had just numbers everywhere and was white. This is a dark scheme, but I think they've really cleaned it up. Uh, it took a little bit of time for me to transition. I, I kind of was angry at myself. It's like, oh, I wish I waited to learn. This is so much easier. Um, but I've been using it for 10 years, so I couldn't do that. Um, I would say the coolest thing about V-Ray now is it's way easier for a beginner to jump into. You can close down the side panels. You can just focus your attention right on here on the quality and a couple other basic settings and, and get great results without digging into details. I, I did a little bit of digging. I try to keep that to a minimum, but I think that's gonna help beginners the most. Um, this is so much more organized. Just uh, try to avoid some of these things until you get like a, a long uh, bit of experience behind you. Because there's a lot of settings in here. You can see all the things moving around as I change the quality. So yeah. that's not necessary unless, uh, unless it's uh, special circumstances. Cool. And does it have atmosphere control? Yeah, it's brand new. Um, there it's called volumetrics and it's uh, attached to lighting. And it's so new, I haven't even tried it. I've just read about it and um, seen it in the scene. So I believe you can have, basically if you're not familiar with this concept, um, a light is pretty much invisible until it hits something, right? There's, there's a beam coming out, you can't see the beam. You can see the uh, reflection of it and you can see the shadow. Volumetrics um, creates uh, like an atmospheric effect. You can see little dust particles or the edges of the beam. It's really cool. Um, if you have if you have something like um, a flashlight or a headlight of a vehicle and you wanna see the edge of the beam, that'll work perfect for you. So yeah, it's brand new. Sorry, I haven't tried it. No, something to I've look forward to. I've been waiting for it for a long time. <laughs> something to look forward to. And yeah. how do you map decals onto models in V-Ray? Say you wanted to map graphics onto a model. How do you accomplish that? Okay, the great question. Yeah, that is the next step. I didn't want to cover that because you can spend a whole hour doing texture mapping. Let's switch to the rendered view. Um, so in Rhino, hopefully you guys have used it before, and you've got the shaded view, which I tend to spend most of my time in. Um, rendered view will show you the texture maps. So this toast just have is a graphic that's been applied to that one face on the top, and I put a different one on the back side. Um, same thing over here on the eyeballs. This was actually easier because I split out, let me go to shade of view. I split out, uh, there's a sphere for the back part of the eye and there is just a little split out piece here. I'm turning the ISO curves on so you can see it. And I applied a texture map to that eyeball 
of uh, kind of a, a graphic from an eye. So let's take a look at that. So, and this is really important to understand too in materials, we kind of glossed over it due to the time. So here's the eyeballs. Let's open up the detail here. So notice it's got a gray color. We talked about diffuse and what that was. And so that will show up unless you've applied a graphic on top of it. The graphic covers it up. And there's the graphic, I just clicked on it. So, um, and you have some controls about placement and Rhino has uh, things called texture mapping widgets. So you can move things up, down, left, right. If they don't align properly. Um, this one was a perfect circle on a square graphic and I just mapped it right on there. It worked fine. Um, again, we go back to rendered view. And so that shows up pretty well. It's kind of recessed, so it's not getting a lot of light. So that's the that's texture mapping. That's all there is to it. If you're lucky, the graphic goes where you want. If not, you got to use what's called the mapping widgets. Um, and to find those is you would pick um, an object. I think this toast is grouped. Okay, the toast is grouped, but if I were to pick that object, you would go into Rhino. So um, Rhino has materials. We're not using them because we're using V-Ray. Um, this is kind of weird. Rhino has materials for its for the Rhino rendering engine. We're, we're switching over to V-Ray, but Rhino has great texture mapping tools. So these are different ways to project onto a surface. So we can do a flat plane or we can wrap a box. We can have a box for something that's got multiple sides, or if it's just this blob, we can apply a spherical mapping widget and that guides the graphic around it. But I think in my example, they're super simple because we got flat toast and this eye is pretty, pretty flat too. But that's how it works um, with the materials. So two basic areas of, of showing up is your diffuse color. If I turn this graphic off, here's a checkbox, now you see the diffuse color. So that's kind of cool. You can actually speed up renderings if you need to. So graphics always cover up the basic or diffuse color. I know it's kind of a weird word, diffuse. It means it's overall fundamental color. It's diffuse channel. So if you have a texture map there, it's covered up, you'll never see the gray. All right, wow. Cool, does the material for the glow wall have emissivity? It does, we didn't have time to cover that, but now I will. Let's go to the Studio Emissive Glow Wall. So this, um, we have a whole series of uh, materials. I love these um, inside V-Ray. We'll grab one here in a second. So it's actually emitting light. So I didn't have a chance to talk about this too much, but the whole uh, concept of this studio is I didn't wanna see the back wall. I wanted to perfectly white. So you guys remember that from the renderings and the examples. So how do you make something always be perfectly white? Well, you turn it into a giant light. So you don't see shadows on light bulbs, basically. That's, that's what's happening. So let's make a brand new one. We're going to go to the emissive materials. And here's all the different glowing, here's like digital clocks. I usually pick this one called LED 8000. Uh, that's the Kelvin color temperature. Drag it over here. So notice it's got a little bit of blue. No problem. I'm just going to click on the swatch and I'm going to go perfectly white. That's it. Step one. Now the default of one I've noticed is not quite as bright as I want. Um, so I just bump it up to 1.5. Boop. It gets a little bit brighter and it casts a little bit of light. You'll see it kind of on the side here. Not as bright as a light and definitely do not make the mistake thinking I can light my whole scene with this. This is just a kind of a studio effect. Um, emissive materials are primarily designed to be self-illuminating, not illuminate an environment or a scene. So think of like neon. You're not gonna light a whole room with neon. You're just gonna have just a cool little effect over there in the corner. So that's how I made the um, emissive glow wall. It's the exact same settings. It's white 1.5, that's it. Cool. Can you use glow maps to light objects? No, I would probably switch. If I wanted to light an, a scene, I've never tried that. It, what they um, have you do instead, uh, go to the background and you can go into the texture. We already looked at this earlier. You can put your own graphic in there. 
this is where if you have a low quality JPEG, it's not going to be very useful. Um, I recommend there's a lot of HDR images, high dynamic range. So the basic differential between high dynamic, low dynamic, here's a great way to explain it. Uh, basic JPEG is low dynamic range and you've got RGB of zero to 255. So I think everybody who's used a computer knows RGB, zero to 255. If you go into Photoshop, you've seen it. Well, the real world, uh, if you go outside and look at the sun and then put your head under a rock, there's more than 255 values between those two spots. Um, so HDR makes the, uh, the three channels of RGB, I think 16,000 or 32,000 values of each. You end up getting like trillions of colors. So they're perfect for the environmental lighting right here. I'm not sure what kind of, um, this is an EXR image, but I also recommend HDR images, high dynamic range. Um, you can find them online. You can just type in environmental or HDR. A lot of them are free, most of them are free. Um, the free ones can be bad, but just keep looking. And this is a weird way to look at it. Uh, a lot of places that give them away, they'll show it wrapped on a sphere so you can get a better idea of how it's gonna look as an environment. This is a really abstract way. I totally agree with that. But this is wrapped onto a sphere. Here's the environmental. So it's creating a reflection of things. Um, so it doesn't look like it's in just a, a fog. If it was all one color, it would not look interesting in the reflections, but it's also lighting. That's the critical thing with the later generation rendering engines is these backgrounds um, are doing all these things here. They're casting illumination and reflections and refraction. Um, I tend to just leave all these alone and just use the master control up here just its overall value. Um, so if, as you add more lights, I, I go down to 0.5 or uh, 0.4, sorry. Um, but as the starting, when I don't have any lights, I'll keep that up to one. But yeah, don't put it, so the, to answer the question more directly, don't put the texture map on the glow wall, put it on the environment. Um, V-Ray was gonna handle it much better. Okay, cool. And the last question, can V-Ray render to an alpha channel so you can bring the render into Photoshop? Oh, yes. Oh, All yeah. Right. So that's a little trickier. Um, there's a couple little ways to do it. Um, one of them involves uh, what's called um, a wrapper material, basically, that if I were to... Um, in fact, that's how... If I jump over, let me show you what happened. I think this would be easier. If I go to this... Okay. Want to go to that page? Oh, you can, you can see enough here. Okay, so that's exactly what I did. I made the glow wall. I turned on the alpha channel. There's a whole bunch of steps to get there now. It's not as easy as it used to be. And then you could see and you could see the checkerboards in Photoshop, right? There's no layer back there. So I just drew a gradient going from white on the edge of the table to kind of a light gray up in the sky. That's the way to do it. Um, save it with a alpha channel. Um, I don't think I have a. Uh, a video on that at LinkedIn currently, but it's coming soon. In fact, this whole lesson um, will be eventually a LinkedIn learning course. Something really, really close. And we'll definitely cover the alpha channels. Uh, right now, uh, we probably wouldn't want to alpha channel the bowl because it's underneath. Definitely um, would want to do it with a glow wall. And it's super easy. Yeah, the back, typically I do the, the back wall and then I can put it into an environment. You can actually alpha channel um, everything you want and put it into a new scene. Maybe they're in the desert. So you can just use the stuff to kind of reflect and bounce light. Um, that can be really challenging. If you put it in the desert, it's, it's gonna look very strange because the lighting won't match. But maybe if you put it in someone's kitchen, it could be a lot closer. Hmm. Great news about the alpha channels. Cool, and I wanna actually wrap it up not with a question, but with a comment, a compliment actually. So uh, thank you so much. As a newbie, I was imagining being overwhelmed, but that was a great and inspiring. And that is because Dave is a great teacher. So- Hey. Yeah. Thank I'm you, just... random viewer. <laughs> thank you so much, Dave. I'm- uh... So sorry, I have to take the screen away now to uh, wrap up with my own conclusion and okay. show you the place where you can find V-Ray next for Rhino and Rhino and the 3D mouse, the space mouse. And I also want to thank you for attending and show you again 
uh, the place, uh, the links where you can find the free 30 day uh, LinkedIn uh, promo and also visit uh, professor3d.com to find out more about Dave and hire him because we can get enough of him. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. This is so nice. <laughs> so I've been recording this session all along and I will post it on YouTube and Vimeo later so you can tell your friends and watch it over and over again and have more fun. Dave, any last words? You know, if I just want to remind people that um, Novage is a really cool place um, to buy software. And if you're a student or faculty, I keep surprising people by mentioning this. They have educational discounts. So, yes, this is a, kind of a, a hidden gem. Um, for example, Rhino is about $1,000 retail. Um, the commercial version is $800. Students and faculty can get it for $140. Just scan your ID and get it. There is, um, I warn my students, don't go get um, illegal software. When it's this cheap, you're a student, take advantage of the deals. It's 140 bucks for Rhino, and I think something close for V-Ray. Yes, please do. Thank you, Dave, for the <laughs> for the advertising, and uh, we want to thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. It's always a great pleasure, and looking forward to more Novage webinars with you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye. -bye. bye.